Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise, let praise arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. We cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, 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 oh. we praise you. Oh, 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 Let faith be the song that overcomes the rage you see. Let faith be the song that calms the storm inside of me. Let you die. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. You cannot survive when we praise you. We got a breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him up. We call creation cry, God. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what we feel like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. You'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. We got a breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him up. This 
is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I see you done for me. You can clap your hands this morning as we sing. Who brings our chaos? Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nation with truth Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my search the world but it couldn't fill me man's empty praise treasures of faith are never enough and you came along and put me back together Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. There's nothing better to see out. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid 
to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you see them all, and you still call me fair. As the God of the mountain, He's the God of the valley. Come on. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. 
They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all unknown. Sing, oh, praise. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For in this days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. And so, Father, as we prepare our hearts now for communion, as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, Lord, I pray that you would examine each of our hearts the elements that are before us. And I pray, Lord, that you would make the bread and the cup more than what they are, more than a memorial, that you would give us the blessings of your promised Holy Spirit that came at Pentecost, and those blessings would be attendant in the partaking of Holy Communion today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So just a, a word of instruction. Uh, as you came in the door, you would have received the little what I call COVID communion cups, uh, the ones that are COVID friendly, if you will. If you don't have one of those, let's uh, put up a hand and we'll make sure that one of our ushers gets round to you and you can have uh, a communion with us. Now, as I say that, what I always like to say when we partake of communion together, as Paul talks to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he, he issues kind of a, a warning to us that we would not want to take communion in an unworthy manner, he says. That we would want to examine our hearts to see, first of all, are we at peace with God? Are we at peace with Him? And are we at peace with one another? If we're not, as I pray in a moment, the, the prayer of institution, what we can do, John Wesley says this, that when we partake of communion, it can be a time of, of repentance. It can be a time of saying, God, I'm sorry. God, I want to be able to take this communion in a worthy manner. So you know what's going on inside of me. You know what's going on in my heart. You know if I have issues with those around me. Take care of those, please, because I want to be able to partake of communion. Also, one other thing we have noticed, as probably many of you have, uh, this particular cup, we've ordered the, uh, the wafers are gluten-free, so those of you that are concerned about gluten, they are gluten-free, but they are in particular hard to peel back to get the wafer, <laughs> and when you do it, you end up opening the cup. So I would just say take care as you open that little top bit because the top peels off. We'll partake of the bread together and then we'll partake of the cup. I want to put a phrase uh, up on the screen for us today. And that phrase is hocus pocus. Now turn to the person next to you and when you hear the phrase hocus pocus, what do you think? Turn to the person next to you and tell them. Hocus pocus. Somebody said, I think it was Brad that said this morning, he also thinks of the phrase abracadabra. Huh? Hocus pocus, yeah. Hocus pocus diddly ocus was, was, a, was a phrase that was in one of the movies that I watched one time, and I thought that was rather cute. Hocus pocus has to do with magic, doesn't it? Has to do with pull a rabbit out of your hat sort of thing, yes? Well, do you know where that phrase comes from? That phrase comes from the serving of the Lord's Supper in the Middle Ages, would you believe? Did you know that hocus pocus is, is connected to communion? Here's how. When communion was simply in Latin, because remember, Roman Catholic priests 
spoke Latin. The mass was given in Latin. So if you spoke any other language, you, you were beholden to knowing what the priest was about to say, right? Well, he spoke in Latin, and if you spoke English, you were like, okay, I, I, I don't know what he's saying. But you always knew that when he came to lift the cup and bless the bread and all that, he said the same words over and over again, and so your English ears leaned in to the Latin. Well, do you know what he said when he said, this is my body, what he said in Latin? Here's the phrase. He said, hoc est meum corpus. Hoc, this, est, is, meum, my, corpus, body. Now, if you have English ears and are listening quickly, do you know how to listen quickly? <laughs> You're listening, oh, what's he saying? What's he saying? Oh, he, yeah, okay, get ready. We're going to take the Lord's Supper. Get ready. He's saying, hoc est meum corpus, hoc est meum corpus. Say it fast, hoc est meum corpus, hoc est corpus, hoc est corpus, hoc est hocus pocus. To English ears, yes? And then hocus pocus came to mean magic because guess what? If you're a Roman Catholic, there's this theology called, this is a long word, get ready for it, you'll want to you'll wanna cough when you hear this word, transubstantiation, where the bread became the body of Jesus, where the wine became the blood. And so if you're a street person and you rock up to a Latin service, you sort of say to, the, to yourself, well, the priest, when he does that thing up the front that he does with the bread and the, and, and the cup, he does a bit of hocus pocus because the bread magically becomes the body and the cup magically becomes the blood. Folks, sadly, that was the deepest valley, I believe, that the church sunk into because what happened was it gave the implication that only the priests in the garments, the long and flowing robes, only they were the holy ones. And if you had to approach God, you had to approach God through them. Folks, the good news is the church has grown up. The church has matured. And so if you love the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you love your neighbor as yourself then hallelujah, the sacrament of communion is for you. And it doesn't take any hocus pocus diddly ocus for you to take it. You simply need lean into the Holy Spirit. And so, Father, as we come to you, we pray. We pray that you would remind us of the words that Jesus said when he broke bread. When he was with his disciples on that night, he broke bread and he took it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. And as often as you partake of this, do so in remembrance of me. And also after supper, he took the third cup. The Passover cup is the third cup called the cup of redemption. And he lifted it and blessed it. And he said, this cup is now in, has new meaning. It's in a new covenant, which is written for in my blood, if you will, poured out for the forgiveness of, of sins, for the remission of transgression, for the cover of iniquity, as often as you do so, do so in remembrance of me, because you'll not do this again until I come again in my kingdom. And so, Lord, as we partake of the bread, as we peel back that little cup, and as we take that wafer, as we partake of your body, remind us now who you are and what you did for us as your body was broken on the cross. Let's partake together. In the same way, Lord, as we partake of the fruit of the vine, it's grape juice and everyone knows it, not wine, but it is the same stuff. It is of the same stuff. As we partake of this, I pray that you would remind us that your blood atones, your blood covers our sins, and so it is not held against us. The debt has been paid. It has been 
paid in full. And as we partake, may we do so in remembrance of you until you come again. And so, Spirit of God, thank you for how you bless us. Thank you for how you have infused us with yourself, as we're going to talk about today. We are a kingdom force because of your power. And as we are getting ready to sing, oh, praise the name of Jesus, we're reminded that on the third day, you stood death on its head and caused it to work backwards. And so for that, we praise you. We are people of the cross, but we are people also of the power of resurrection. In your name we pray. Amen. Stand with us and let's finish. Oh, praise the name of Jesus. Then on the third, at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. Oh, trampled death, where is your sting? For Christ the King Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God Oh, praise His name forevermore For in this day we will sing blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus face oh as we pray together. I'll ask the communion stewards to come forward and wait on us here up the front and we'll take offering after we pray. And so, Father, you are Lord. You are God. I'm reminded of that. <laughs> I'm reminded of that um, quite often when I say my, my own name, Joel, Joel, means the Lord is God. You are God. And we praise your name. We praise you, we enthrone you, as your prophet says, that you be, you sit enthroned on the praises of your people. And so the more we praise you, the more you are enthroned, and the more you draw all men and women, boys and girls, unto yourself. And so, Lord, here we are. Here we are such as we are. We come from all walks of life. We come from weeks that have been weeks where we're feeling on top of the world and we have much to praise you for. Some of us come from weeks that, oh, we're lower than a snake's belly. And when we look around, we're, we're wondering and we're wondering, when will it ever get better? And Father, I am reminded that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Whether we're on top of the world, Christ is risen. 
whether we're down the bottom, Christ is risen. And everywhere in between, Christ is risen. So here's the good news. If Christ be risen from the dead, and He is the first one to have done so, the first fruits from all creation, we too will follow in His footsteps, but we've got to be able to say His name. We've got to be able to not only say His name, but believe in our hearts that He is the Son of God, Lord of all. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God has raised Him from the dead, we shall be saved. We shall be saved. I believe that with my whole heart. I've given my entire life to that truth. And so here we are today, such as we are. There are those that are absent from us because they are sick or they have uh, copped an injury and are unable to be here. I think of the Gaskell family. Thank you, Lord, that you have brought Elizabeth from Brisbane and now back home, and she is recovering. Um, I thank you that uh, just this past week she was shifted from Brisbane, the Royal, up to Harvey Bay, and I believe the good news is she has returned home now and is at Bottle Brush and is recovering. We pray, Lord, for her throat because the surgery went through her throat cavity. Uh, she's having a bit of trouble swallowing. She's having trouble with her voice. I pray that you would heal all of that and make it come right. You are the Lord of our bodies. So do that, I pray. Father, for the Urbacher family who have uh, recently come down with a uh, bout of COVID, Lord, we pray that you would cover that family with your protection, uh, help them to come through this virus quickly as if it were simply a blip on the screen and it's behind them before they know it. Cover them, I pray. Lord, for those that are new to us today, including myself as a new pastor, for those that have been here since this church was founded in 1978, I pray your richest blessing on each and every one of us as we lean in, as we worship you. We love you. We praise you for your love for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you would cast your eyes on the side screens for announcements, we would appreciate that as the offering is being taken. Hey ladies, there's a Women Alive event happening on Saturday, the 21st of May. It's um, in Clontarf, which is near Redcliffe, um, Northside Brisbane. This event costs $35 for one person, and if you bring a friend, then it only costs um, $10 extra. There will be a yummy brunch provided by the host church, um, some live entertainment, a pressed flower frame craft that will be guided, and um, we'll hear a lovely testimony from Amelia Wyndham. Feel free to invite any other ladies you know, whether they're from church or from work or just a neighbor. Daughters who are teenaged and older are of course welcome. And there is a table in the foyer by the Next Steps area where you can get some more information and sign up. And you can get some flyers as well. High school camp is coming up. It's from year sevens to year twelves. And it's at QCC Mapleton this year uh, from the 3rd of July to the 8th of July um, and it costs $400 to come so you should hang up. Hello Mothers of Life Church. Uh, the 8th of May which is the first Sunday of the month is Mother's Day so if you're a mother or you have a mother you should come to church on that day. We will do lots of mothery things and <laughs> it'll be a good time to celebrate our mothers and everything that they do for us. See you there. Thanks for that, Ethan. Lots of mothery things. I, I think that's pretty cool. I have it on pretty good authority uh, that there'll be a couple of surprises, mums. And uh, for those of you that uh, don't have your mums here or would like to invite them along next Sunday, uh, there is going to be an element, hopefully mums, that will tickle your funny bone. And then afterwards, there's going to be an element that might tickle your tummy, uh, something that uh, you might find rather sweet in more ways than one. So mums, come on along. We'd love to have you. Now, a couple of things so that we avoid misunderstanding. I quite often say a pastor really, really has to mind what he says up the front, right? 
or he has to mind what he does, otherwise some, something could be taken wrong. When I talked earlier about the church in the Middle Ages, of course you know that the only church that was in existence then would have been the Roman Catholic Church. I was not dissing the Roman Catholic Church of all ages. I was simply saying that that's when the church kind of reached its low point. And I am not, if you, so if you were raised Roman Catholic, or maybe you are a practicing Roman Catholic and visiting today, I, I believe that the Roman Catholic Church loves Jesus, and I believe that they have done a lot of changing, and so I, I was not putting that church down in my comments about communion, okay? Secondly, it has come to my attention that some of you were wondering about a little gathering that we had, a little eatery sort of thing that we had last Sunday right after the service, and you're bumping one another and going, I saw so-and-so at that lunch, and so-and-so, how come I didn't get an invitation? Whoa, wait a minute, I want to eat with the pastor too. Well, that was our first agape feast. Remember a few weeks back when Pastor Caleb talked about Holy Communion and about gathering together and partaking of meals together as they did in Acts chapter 2? That is our first agape feast. Guess what? I'm one, Karen and I are only two people. And I, we serve a church of well over 200. How, am, how are we, how am I, how are we able to get to know all of you if you rock up at the same time? So it's an intimate setting. Every, listen, every six weeks, we will draw names from a hat. Just so you know, it's random draw. We'll draw names from a hat, families from Maryborough, because we are Life Church Maryborough, families from Harvey Bay, because we are Life Church Harvey Bay. So if you didn't happen to get an invitation to this one, Every six weeks, we're going to have another one, and they'll be in various areas, various homes, some in Harvey Bay, some here in the borough. So your invitation is in the mail, lest you fear that you have been overlooked. You have not, okay? Mark it down, all right. And uh, the other thing that I would just say to you is on this holiday weekend, uh, May Day today, I, you guys do this uh, pinch and a punch first day of the month, that, that sort of thing. I've, I've learned about that, and I've got marks all over me because of it, you know. So it's May Day in the Northern Territory, and I understand that it's Labor Day for us tomorrow. Is that correct? Do I have that right? So just when we get some momentum going, we Aussies take a holiday, don't we? Yeah, here we go. So welcome. Glad that you're here. And I trust that you will lean into this message. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh, Lord, our rock, my rock, my redeemer. We love you. We thank you for your word. Help it to transform us, not just inform us. I pray in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. We are in a message series entitled, On Earth as in Heaven. On earth as it is in heaven, Jesus prayed in the Lord's Prayer. And so what he is saying to us in that prayer is that as the kingdom comes, and it has come in him, it has come through him, as the kingdom was inaugurated in him, he desires for his kingdom to come on earth as in heaven. And when he comes again, see, we're between the comings, aren't we? We're between the advents. We're between the advent first one where he came as a lowly babe in a manger, unassuming, heralded by angels, attended to by shepherds, and a, probably a 14, 15, or 16-year-old girl and her hubby. When he comes again, the Bible says he's not going to come so meek and mild, is he? He is going to come as King of kings and Lord of lords. It says the archangel will sound the trumpet, and from east to west the sky will be split in two, and every soul on earth, every soul will know that he is King of kings and Lord of lords. As a matter of fact, it says that every knee will bow, whether on earth, under the earth, or above the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, we will bow the knee. 
we will bow the knee, whether now, willingly, or one day, hopefully willingly, but for some, maybe against your will. So today, last week, we talked about the kingdom. What is the kingdom? Today, we're going to talk about the kingdom force. Who are those of us who are part of the kingdom, and we are, if you will, a force to be reckoned with? I would invite you to turn with me to Acts chapter 8. I'm sorry, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, um, Luke's second installment. He wrote the Gospel of Luke, and then he also wrote again to Theophilus, the book of the Acts of the Apostles. And then hold your thumb there or your finger there if you've got your Bibles with you. Um, and we're going to flip back to the end of Matthew, the Great Commission, verse, uh, verses 18 through 20 of chapter 28. Here we go. On this idea of kingdom force, God, through Christ, raised him from the dead. And then, as we read in Acts 1, the first seven verses, Jesus hung out with the disciples. Now, we're not just talking about any, not just Jesus of Nazareth. We're now talking about the resurrected Christ hung out with the disciples for 40 days, teaching them all about the kingdom, having a meal with them talking to them about who he is and who they are in reference to who he is and who they are as a kingdom bringer or as kingdom bringers, as a kingdom force. And he says this, after you have waited in Jerusalem, after you have waited in Jerusalem, you will receive power from on high when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses. Now, here's where we can insert Matthew 28, 18 through 20. We'll get to that in a minute, but just sort of put your thumb there. This is how we will witness, okay? He goes on, though. He says, telling people about me everywhere. Where? Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Matthew says this. Before Jesus ascended into heaven, he left them with his final words. His final words of purpose on this earth were these. Jesus came, told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Do you know what all means in the Greek? All. When, when it's written in Greek and it says all, it means everything. Not anything has been left to chance. He's been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, he says, while you are going, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And to be sure, be, be sure of this, he says... I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, that reminds me of a joke. Sorry, a lot of things in life remind your pastor of a joke. But here we go. Turns out there was a Roman Catholic priest and a nun that are on a jumbo jet getting ready to travel a transatlantic long flight. And the priest is buckling up and settling in and getting ready to hear the uh, flight attendants give their long speech. And the nun next to the priest is white knuckling it. She'd not been on a flight before, let alone transatlantic. She is scared and the priest just gently taps her on the hand and says, sister, sister, whatever is the matter? Oh, oh, Father, I, I just don't know. I, we're going to take off, and we're going to be in the air, and what if, and what And she's what ifing it, right? And the Father, the, the priest says to her, Sister, remember. Remember what Jesus said just before he ascended through the clouds into the heavens. He said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. She said, Father, I beg to differ. He said, Lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. King James Version, L-O, not L-O-W, right? So folks, today, we are the kingdom force. Do you know that we are the ones in whom Christ entrusted his message? Just push pause for a second and just say, imagine that. And, and what I want to say to that is, is me? 
I, I'm just a farm boy from North Branch, Michigan. You've entrusted the greatest story ever told, the greatest message that have ever, has ever been heard by human ears. You've entrusted that to this kid? Wow. I can say that backwards. Wow. I just can't imagine. But he did. He said that greater things will you do than these because why? I go to the Father because I'm out of here. I leave this world, I leave this world in your hands to bring the kingdom on earth as in heaven. So I leave you with this thought. If there's one thing that I would want you to tuck away today, it would be this. If you're a follower of Christ, as Christ followers, we can become a kingdom force to be reckoned with by, and we need to parse every phrase in chapter 1, verse 8. Now, I will just say this. If you're not a Christ follower, if you're not a Christ follower today, I would invite you to eavesdrop on this message because here's, here's what this message will do. This message will invite you into a world and into a life like you have never known it before because of who Jesus is and because of what he has done for us, all we need to do is receive that. We'll talk about that more later. Here's what we should understand. As Christ followers, we are a kingdom force. How? We're a force to be reckoned with. How? One, by receiving God's power for his purposes. For his purposes. Subpoint. When he said, wait in Jerusalem and you will receive power from on high, let's take that first verse, he didn't say you would receive the fruit of the Spirit, did he? He didn't say the fruit of the Spirit there. He didn't even say that you'll receive the gifts of the Spirit. He didn't say that there. He said you will receive Holy Spirit power for his purposes. Now let's not confuse it. He did not also say that you will receive Holy Spirit power for your purpose. And he didn't even say that you would, that your power would be for Holy Spirit purposes. Let's not get that wrong. Let's back up and unpack that a minute, okay? First off, fruit of the Spirit, and we'll be talking about that in a few weeks. Paul says the fruit of the Spirit is love. And then he gives you a laundry list after that, doesn't he? That's the fruit of the Spirit. That's Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23. We'll unpack that in a few weeks. He didn't say we'd receive the gifts of the Spirit. They accompany the Spirit, and we quite often emphasize them more than we do the Spirit himself, church. Uh-oh, we get in trouble when we do that. Christ followers, if you ever fall more in love with the gift than the giver of the gift, you're in strife. If you ever emphasize the gifts of the Spirit more than the one who gave them, you're in strife. Never want to do that. Have to be careful there. And then he says, Holy Spirit power for his purposes. And we'll get to what that purpose is for a moment. But when I try to use Holy Spirit power for my purposes, listen, mark it down, that is spiritual abuse. Let me say it again. When I try to use Holy Spirit power for my purposes, that's spiritual abuse. That's not of the Spirit. Let's give a few modest examples of that. What would it look like to use God's purpose for your own selfish ambition? Well, let's start early. <laughs> let's start before the beginning. Let's start with Lucifer. Let's start with the son of the dawn. Isaiah chapter 14 unpacks that. Ezekiel in, in, in another chapter unpacks who this Lucifer was, who this enemy of God's people is. He's a perfect unholy example of applying, trying to apply God's power for his own purposes. Why? He tried to use that power to take over the throne. And then what did he do when God created his beautiful creation and crowned it with glory and honor with Adam and then Eve? He tried to get in and muck up the works, didn't he? He tried to say, oh, you can become as gods if you'll just listen. 
listen to me. Listen, you shall be a like God because we know he's holding out on you. This fruit that he says don't take, he's scared that you'll take it because you'll become like him, knowing good from evil. And that caused Eve to go, hmm, hmm, what if he's holding out on us? What if he's behind a curtain somewhere and hiding what's really going on? And from there, the rest of the sin story, as, as I have said before, are like floats in a parade. You know how one float follows another and follows another, and you just keep watching them go, like this, right? When she disbelieved, that was the first sin. When she thought to herself, maybe this serpent is right. Disbelief caused her to reach, first off, caused her to look, and it was it looked good to the eye. Caused her to reach, ooh, this feels pretty good to me. Caused her to take a bite, and then she offered it to her husband. And those of you men in the room that said, well, if the man wouldn't have listened to his wife, are you kidding me? When does that ever happen? All that happened from there started with this little niggle, maybe God's holding out on us. The sons of Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu disobeyed the Lord and attempted a workaround of God's commands regarding the fire of incense. You remember that story, Leviticus 10? The King James Version says they used strange fire before the Lord, and they were immediately judged for it. In the presence of the Lord, they were abusing His power, and the Bible says fire came from the Lord and consumed them. Why? They spiritually abused the power of God in the presence of God. And that causes me just to go, Oh Lord, may I never be found to be abusing your power because I have the title of reverend in front of my name, the title of pastor in front of my name. Lord, Lord, help. May I never, may we never abuse your power. Paul and Silas encountered this in Philippi with the fortune-telling girl. Remember her? Acts chapter 16. She was making money for her masters. <laughs> she, was, she was a fortune teller. She could tell the future. Paul and Silas rock up, and she goes around following them saying, listen to these guys, listen to these guys. They're going to tell you all about salvation. You better listen. And she followed them everywhere they went. And finally, it says, the Bible says Paul got exasperated with that. In other words, he, he was like, shut up, right? And he spoke to the demon, the demon that was mimicking God's power. He spoke to the demon and said, out you go, get out of here. Well, then you know what they copped for that? The masters who had lots of money in their wallet They were pretty powerful in Philippi. They booked them. They said, Paul and Silas, off you go. You're going to prison. And you might go, oh, wow. That's really bad news. No, that was good news because God's power was shown through them in prison, was it not? You know the rest of that story. If you don't, I challenge you, read the book of Acts because power was displayed even in prison. And I offer you this one, the last phrase there. He didn't give, it's not about my power for his purposes. Who made that mistake? Abraham. Abraham and Sarah made that mistake, didn't they? God gave him the purpose. The purpose was, you will be the father of many nations. You'll be the father of many nations. And, and, and Sarah said, well, I'm 90, mate, and you're 100. We're getting up there in age. We better, we better get busy here. Well, I'm, I'm, my, my womb is closed. Well, here's my handmaiden, Hagar. She is of childbearing age. You have her. And, I, and Abraham thought, yep, good idea. And off came Ishmael. And from that, we have copped a war, if you will, between the sons of Ishmael, who are mainly Muslims, 
and the sons of Isaac, who are Jews and Christians, and you know the rest of that story. We are still in turmoil because Abraham used his power for God's purposes. Now let me just say this. You know what I think the main problem here is? Waiting. 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 Folks, that was 12 seconds. And, and you're already saying, when is he going to fill the room with a voice? I, I, I can't wait any longer. Tick, tick, tick. We, we wait and we like, I'm impatient. It, 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 it's already, oh, it's already five till. I wonder when he's going to land this plane because we've got, we've got pork in the oven, right? You wait and you wait. And what happens when you wait? Ooh, if you wait in the flesh, it's bad news, folks, isn't it? It's bad news when the clock is ticking and you're waiting for a result that you're looking for. The resurrected Jesus told his disciples, told his first followers, and he's telling us through them over a meal, wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit to descend with power and purposes. You know what's interesting? <laughs> these, these are good Jewish boys. And you know what festival they're in the midst of? It's called the festival, the Feast of Weeks. It's called Shavuot, S-H-A-V-U-O-T. Shavuot literally means weeks. And you know what that is? It's the counting of the grain between the barley harvest and the wheat harvest. And Jesus modestly says to them, wait, wait, go back to Jerusalem and wait. Well, they were used to waiting. Because the barley harvest took place in this part of the spring, and the wheat harvest took place in this part of the spring-summer, and guess what? Wheat was a whole lot more tasty than barley. Wheat commanded a greater price per bushel or per peck or what was the measurement back then? I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting it. You know the one I mean. And so the, the time between barley harvest and wheat harvest was about how long? 50 days. And so agriculturally, they knew what it meant to tick, 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 wait, wait, wait. And they had something called the counting of the omer, O-M-E-R, where every day between... I keep getting ready to fall off this and everybody's ready for me to fall, right? Stay over here. Sorry, guys. Those of you watching online, I'll stay this way, okay? They kept counting the omer, which is the sheaf of grain, and day one, and day two, and day three. And at about day two or three, Jesus is saying this to his disciples, go back to Jerusalem and wait, wait for power from on high. What is the purpose of a wait? What is the purpose of God telling us to wait? What happens when we really, really wait on God? First, I offer this. Our hope for God and his outcome is heightened as we stand on tiptoe waiting for that purpose. It reminds me of my little blondie, Mackenzie. When she was about three or four years old and daddy would offer to fix her brekkie, and I would tell her that we're going to have Pillsbury cinnamon rolls. And at age three, she knew what a Pillsbury cinnamon roll was. You call them cinnamon scrolls here, right? And, and when they come out of the oven and they're waiting for that icing, and, and they're up on the bench, and she's three, I can still see her in her little pink nightgown, her curly blonde hair that had all kinds of rats in it from the night before. I can still see her going like this. She's trying to see what she's about to get. And then you slather that sweet scroll with as much butter as you possibly can get. And you're going, oh my goodness, how long is he going to be preaching? I want one of those. Yes. Listen. When I told Mackenzie that she was going to get a cinnamon scroll, guess what? 
she believed me. Why? Because when daddy says he's going to do something for her in her little three-year-old heart, she would go, yep, it's going to happen. I'm going to get to bite into that. And because she trusted dad, ooh, for those of you that are in a waiting game right now, for those of you that are waiting on the Lord, I'm just going to ask you, you think you can trust dad to come through for you? Do you think you can go, he said it, he said it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand on tiptoe waiting, and it's been two and a half years, ask Karen and I what that looks like, coming together, waiting, waiting, waiting. When Australia said there's no end date in sight to this COVID nightmare, we're waiting, waiting, waiting. And then Karen said something interesting to me this morning. She said, our hope changed, didn't it, when the visa came through and we knew that it was only going to be about 28 to 30 days and I would be in Australia. Oh, and you know what that reminded me of? The difference between, listen, the difference between what the world says is hope and what the Bible says is hope. If the world gives you an end day, then we go, well, this is going to happen on day dot. What happens to hope then? Well, it's just a matter of looking at the clock and going, yep, 14 days left, 13, 12, 11, like the counting of the Omer, huh? But I call that a lottery hope. I call that a lottery-based hope. So if you buy a lottery ticket, you hope, you hope that you'll win, all right? But guess what? There's going to be millions that won't and only one that will. And a lottery-based hope is maybe I will and maybe I won't. But biblical hope is this. Mark it down, friends. Biblical hope is this. God doesn't always give an end date. As a matter of fact, He often does not. He just says, I'm coming back. Hang in there. And we go, well, really? Well, and, and you ask questions like the disciples did. When are you going to restore your kingdom? And are we going to get to be a part of it? Is it this age or the age to come? Is it going to happen in April or May? Is it going to happen this year? And you have the Hal Lindsays and all the rest of them that are writing books about when this thing's going to happen. Here's what happens though, folks. If God were to give us an end date, If he were to give us, I am announcing that I am sending my son back on the 3rd of fill-in-the-blank, 2024, what would we do? We would focus more on the date than we would the God who said it. Wouldn't we? I've I've had young adults tell me, Pastor, I've asked God, and I've asked God, and I've asked God. I've asked him for what's my purpose in life. I just wish that he would write it across the sky. Joel Heron, this is what you're supposed to do. If God became a sky writer, we would pay more attention to the writing in the sky than we would the God behind the writing. Ooh. But if he says, I'm coming again, Lean into me. Love me. You see, I I, I think of it this way. I think of it this way. When we know that we can trust him, when we know that he is going to do what he says he is going to do, it's about us leaving it in his hands rather than taking it into our own. It's about him saying what he says, and we go, yeah, I trust that. Waiting's hard, God. Waiting's hard, but I trust you. Leaving it in his hands and waiting on him. Number two, he says that we are to be his witnesses. His witnesses of the inbreaking of the kingdom through Jesus Christ. So what does it mean to be a witness? What does it mean to be a witness? Turn to the person next to you, and if I told you that you had to be a witness to testify in a court of law, what would that look like? Turn to the person next to you for the next 30 seconds and, and tell each other, what's it mean to be a witness? Go.
All right, by the way, I give you a little asterisk here from the first point. This is my, this is my philosophy about the Lord's coming. I, I invite this. To, I heard it from somebody else. It's not original to me, but it's worthy of writing down. Folks, we should live like He's coming today. We should work like He's never coming. Think about it. We should live like He's going to rock up right now. He comes as a thief in the night. But we should, if we, if we worked like that, we would just, we'd, we'd cross our hands and go, well, I'm right. Hope everybody else in the world is. Oh, no. If we work like he's never coming, if we work like we've got more souls to save, we've got more souls to cross the line of faith, we've got more to pray in and invite in, oh, we've got work to do, yes? That's how we ought to wait. What does it mean to be a witness? Very simply, you witness in a court of law the, the prosecutor or the defense attorney or the judge is going to look at you and say, okay, tell me what you saw, tell me what you heard. That's a witness. That's as simple as that. This is what I saw. This is what I heard from my perspective, from my eyes, from my vision, from my hearing. This is what happened. And what do you have from the apostles over and over and over again? Think of the apostle John. I, I love what John says over and over in the book of Revelation. He talks about the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. He says of the believers that they overcame the, the, the enemy with what? The blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Again and again, they talked about Jesus Christ and him crucified and him raised from the dead. As a matter of fact, John says in his first letter, I I write this to you to what? Make my joy complete. To make my joy complete. And he would, wouldn't he? If he got to spend three and a half years with the Son of God, he would want to tell us about it, wouldn't he? Think about it. for Just for a second. When you experience... Oh, I don't know. What 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 is Aussie World has these rides and what what's the what's the name of the roller coaster park that's south of Brizzy between there and the Gold Coast? Dream World. Dream World. When you ride those new rides at Dream World and you've never ridden them before and you have just this high and your belly is in your throat and whoo, wow, was that ever a ride? The first thing is the joy of the experience itself. What do you do next? If you're a teenager, you grab your phone and you say, I just rode the whatever ride, you got to ride it too. Don't we do that all the time? If you were, if you've bought a lottery ticket, which I don't advise, but if you bought a lottery ticket and you won, I was just thinking you probably would tell everybody, but maybe you wouldn't. <laughs> right? But, but when you have something that is joyous, Quite often, the very next thing you want to do is tell someone about it. These disciples, these 12, had just experienced the transformation of their lives and everything that was about Jesus, they wanted to tell. And he says this, you're going to be my witnesses. And how will you be my witnesses? By making disciples of all peoples baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them everything that I have commanded you. Why? Because all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me and I now grant it to you. Will you always get it right? Will you always be perfect at it? That's where the church cops it, isn't it? That's where we get it wrong. I have often said this about ministry. Ministry would be great if it wasn't for the people. And I'm one of them. I'm a people. If you think that there is any perfect church on the planet, invite me to it. The moment I walk through the door, it ceases to be perfect. But remember, the perfect Lord of all let it, left it with us, his imperfect body. This was option A for him. Guess what? There was no plan B. No plan B. So Lynn and Jeff, it's up to us. Natalie, it's up to us 
Charlotte, it's up to us. It's up to us. Gary, it's up to us. It's up to us. There's no plan B. To be his witnesses. To be his witnesses and tell of the power of Jesus Christ. So guess what? Every time you see a baptism, I love baptisms. Every time you see a baptism, it's an example of his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. (laughs) We are walking examples of the kingdom. You can go, oh, there goes the kingdom right now. Did you hear what she just said to her? Did you hear that bit of encouragement? Oh, there goes the kingdom. And you hear a testimony up the front. Thank you, Lord, your kingdom come on earth in one more person, in one more person on earth as in heaven. Oh, yes. And finally, finally, we are a kingdom force to be reckoned with. How? By going wherever, however, and to whomever he sends us to witness to. This one is where it gets tricky. In one eight, he said what? You will be my witnesses where? In Jerusalem, hometown, maybe your own family. And for some of you, for some of you go, well, that's easy. I can talk about Jesus to my family. And for others of you, you're like... <gasps> talk to my family about Jesus? Are you kidding me? For some of you, it's really, really easy to talk to your family about Jesus. And for the rest of, the rest of you, it's like, mm, not so much. And you will be my witnesses in Judea, which translates to our peeps, right? Our, our, maybe our hometown and our home state, Australians, Judea, Australia, our people. And then Jesus had to go and insert Samaria. Oh, Jesus, you could have left that one out. Because who are the Samaritans to the Jews? Those people. Not just those people. Watch, watch my face. Those people. Listen, every one of you in here has a Samaritan in your life. Every one of you in here knows what I mean when I say those people. He called us to those people. And we just go, ouch. I'll I'll talk to you. I'll talk about you to my peeps, but please no. You know, I don't even want to speak to them. And for you, it might be, it might not even be about race. For you, it might not even be about class. It might not even be about amount of money. For you, a Samaritan might be, oh, she's the type of person that just gets on my last nerve and pinches. I I don't even want to start a conversation with her, let alone talk to her about Jesus. Those people. Irrespective of persons, wasn't it? And then to the utter ends of the planet. People we haven't even come in contact with. People we don't even know. We don't know what their culture is. And you know what? Their culture might actually be confronting to us. But he called us there as well. That's being a kingdom force. My good friend, Pastor Steve Deneff, we grew up in the same district in in Michigan. He, he, in the East Michigan district, he grew up in, in Flint Bentley at Bentley Wesleyan, not too far from, he now is pastor at College Wesleyan in, uh, in Marion, Indiana. He says this, it's a kingdom, not an empire. It's a commission, not a conquest. It's a kingdom who has a king. And we need relationship with that king. It's not an empire. It's a great commission. The mission of the church always ought to be about making disciples. And for those of you that love a little bit of Greek, I'm just going to give you a little dollop of Greek here. By the way, how many commands are there in the Great Commission? Go ahead, it's, it's, in, it's in your outlines. As a matter of fact, guys back there, if you want to put the Scripture back up, 
Matthew 28, 18 through 20. How many commands are there? Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new commands to obey, all. teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. How many commands? Huh? One. There's one. Make disciples. The way the Greek is written, it has been mistranslated in the English. He did not say, go and make. It was a participial phrase. He said, while you're going. He, he assumed we would be going. He assumed we would not just gather together inside of our air-conditioned sanctuaries. He assumed we would be going while you are going. Make disciples. Now you say, well, hang on, Joel. Teach, that's a command. Uh, and, and baptize, that's a command. But whoa, 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 whoa. That's how you make disciples. You baptize and you teach. You dunk them and then you grow them up. That's what we would say in the English. One command. And how do we do that? Two other commands. We baptize them and we teach them to obey everything Christ has commanded. So there's one command. And church, we better get that one right. Make disciples. He didn't even say make converts. He said make disciples disciples. I love what John Wesley says. Put it up on the screen for me, please. I love John Wesley. I'm a Wesleyan pastor. I better, huh? John Wesley said, do all the good you can by all the means you can in all the ways you can in all the places you can at all the times you can to all the people you can as long as ever you can. Say it with me, church. It's there for you. Here we go. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. And so my question for you as the worship team comes is this. What will it take for you to be part of his kingdom force? What will it take? Bow your heads for me and close your eyes. I don't know what part of the message spoke to you. I don't know what part of the message the Holy Spirit poked you or prodded you or whispered into your ear. Hmm, what about that? Oh, are you listening to what he's saying? Where are you in that? Your Samaritans, who are they? When's the last time you've talked to them? Oh, are you willing to, to get up out of your comfort zone and go and be a witness? Are you willing to broach the subject of Jesus with someone in the, in the aisle, uh, uh, in, the, in the grocery, at Kohl's? Are you willing to talk to the person at the, at the Bowser next to you when you're filling up at the servo? Are you willing to say, God bless, to even broach the conversation? Are you willing to... Get up out of these really, really comfy seats here at Life Church Maryborough. Are you really willing to get up and go and make disciples? As we listen to the worship team play just now, I, I want to leave that with you. And I want to ask the prayer team if they would come. I need a couple of you up the front and, and a couple post yourselves at the back. You, if you've been a prayer team member before, you know who you are. We want to have a time of prayer just now. But with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you're willing to be a part of the kingdom force, witnesses for Christ, I'm just going to ask you unapologetically right now to stand to your feet right where you are. You're willing. You're saying, Pastor, I put my hand up. I stand right now. I'm willing to be part of the kingdom force, witnesses for Jesus Christ. Stand where you are to your feet right now. I'm willing, I'm willing. 
Make me one of your witnesses. And I will do whatever it takes to be a part of your kingdom force. Yes, all over the sanctuary. If you're listening online, you're standing maybe in your lounge room right now or in your kitchen. If you're driving, don't stand up. (laughs) Yeah, yes. Father, you see these souls. You know the intents of their heart. I pray that you would take their commitment, you would fan it into flame and give the gifts that are appropriate to fanning that into flame and make us a force to be reckoned with, not to conquer, but to be commissioned to say, huh, yeah, let's follow Jesus together all the way. In your name we pray, amen. The rest of you stand with us and let's close with this song. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't breathe it. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. My God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giants, no. Cause I know how this story ends. Come on, declare that I know. Yes, I know how this story ends. I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory.
Jeffs, let's give God a clap offering like today. Let's praise God. Praise the Lord. I leave you with this good word. Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 3. You always ought to be prepared to give a reason for the Christian hope that is within you. Always be ready to explain it. But you must do this with a gentle heart and in a respectful way and keep your conscience clear. And so I invite courageous people to pray this prayer after me. I'm going to pray it phrase by phrase. If you would like to repeat it out loud, please do so. Holy Spirit, give me an opportunity this week to explain Jesus to someone and the hope that is within me. Give me your power to be your witness. In your name. Amen. Amen. Let's join one another out in the lobby for a cuppa and uh, a little bit of a conversation. God bless you as you go as his kingdom force. Amen.